We give you glory and honor and adoration. give you glory and praise and honor and adoration, O oh God. We worship you today. We worship you this afternoon. We declare that you are the Lord on the throne. You reign in majesty, you reign in glory and excellency. Your name is the name that is above every other name. That at your name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus.
worship you, Jesus. We give you glory and praise and honor and adoration, O God. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you and we glorify your name. As we declare that you are the Lord on the throne. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you bless this service with your presence. We are here for you. We are hungry and thirsty for you. Our souls and hearts yearn for you. Lord, we pray that we will find you here. And we pray, Lord, that you minister to each one of us at the point of their needs. And Lord, we pray that you give us fellowship with you. Satisfy our hearts with the living water of your presence. May your spirit minister to us. And may your glory shine upon us. We pray for those who are part of this service from far that wherever each one of them is as this word reaches to them that Lord you will also touch their lives and grant them the desires of their hearts today we thank you and we bless you to know that all is well and done for it is in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior we pray and we say a good amen Amen, amen. Thank you so much, singers. May the Lord bless you. May you take your seats now. Amen. I greet you all in the precious name of Jesus. We thank God for the opportunity to be here again. We believe that God has good things in store for us. And uh, for that reason, we be attentive to what he has in store for us. I'd like to share briefly from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. We read from verse 18 to verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. The Bible says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Um, these words we are reading in the Bible were written by Apostle Paul. 
to the Christians who are in the city of Corinth. Um, the first letter of Corinthians primarily deals with problems that were uh, in the church in Corinth that Apostle was trying to handle. He was, uh, I think, in the city of Ephesus. And uh, some Christians traveled from Corinth and came and gave him a report of the church. And uh, the report was loaded with questions that were asked by the believers and also a report of many problems that were happening in the church. And so, Apostle Paul was writing in response to the questions that were asked, but also to the condition that was in the church. Among the many problems that we read that were reported from the church in Corinth was the division that was really destroying the church. The fact that some people um, pledged their allegiance to Apostle Paul, others to a man called Apollos. Then there were others uh, who claimed to follow Peter. And uh, there are others who say they don't care about human leaders. They follow Jesus. And uh, because of these divisions, things were really messy. Particularly this issue of wisdom was not a simple thing. Because it was an age where wisdom was greatly esteemed or what we would call philosophy. Philosophy is, the word philosophy comes from two words, philos and sophia, or philo and sophia, meaning uh, philo is love and sophia is wisdom. And it means love of wisdom. So philosophy is a love of wisdom. Trying to understand uh, the science of life and how things work and uh, um, how should one um, adjust themselves or set themselves in order to have a satisfying life on earth. For a period of about three, four hundred years, Greeks had advanced so much in issues of philosophy uh, science and mathematics at this particular time that Apostle Paul was writing. And possibly this time they, they had come to the height of what you would call the Greek philosophy. Um, and uh, it's like every city in the, in, in the Greece uh, dominion uh, they, there were these halls of discussion there were these groupings. Uh, Corinth was one of the cities that were uh, dominated by the Greeks. It was one of the Greek cities. And uh, next to it was Athens, the very headquarter of the Greek empire of that time. And uh, the very center, the very seat of what you would call the greatest philosophers from Greece. And uh, Corinth, being more of a neighbor, also was dominated by these discussions of philosophy and uh, asking yourself, what are the important, important things in life? Uh, how can you live a satisfying life? How is life positioned? How is life created to operate? Um, what is the meaning of life? How can man find satisfaction in this life before you leave this world? 
And so those were discussions. Uh, in the city of uh, Athens, when Apostle Paul went there, uh, the Bible says he found these philosophers who sat in a certain place and did nothing else the whole day except to discuss the latest ideas and ideologies. And so Corinth was also um, uh, experiencing the same wave uh, at this time. And um, uh, they, they, they will tell us that by the time of the New Testament, there were at least three uh, great universities uh, in the city of Corinth. It was a big city at that time. And so, after Apostle Paul went and preached the gospel, uh, most of the people who initially accepted the gospel were the poor and people of low classes. But with time, others started to join in people of higher classes. But together with that, after Paul left, there are these philosophers that started to, um, to try to come in and join the church. Every ideology has its evangelists. And so the evangelists tried to recruit the Christians uh, into the uh, mode of philosophy. Um, because they were already a prepared group and people who are seeking, people who are in search of a better life uh, in Christ. So they fell victim of this. And uh, some of these philosophers, they came to church and they started to bring a whole lot of confusion uh, about what is important in life, how to get satisfaction in life, how to prepare for the afterlife and those things. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, these brothers, they came to Apostle Paul and says the church is in great confusion. We don't know what to believe. There was this preacher, Apollos, who went there. Yes, he preached the gospel, uh, but he preached a compromised gospel. Uh, and uh, he, the, the Bible says he was, uh, he, he was a man of words, a man who was very, very good, very eloquent in his argument and very persuasive. And uh, for that reason, a lot of people felt that he was even much more superior than Apostle Paul. And they started to choose him over Apostle Paul. And so now Apostle Paul is dealing with this issue in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. So it was a major issue if he could deal with it uh, in three chapters. And uh, when Paul is writing, uh, he is writing to them, uh, actually when you read chapter 2, uh, he tells them it's not that we did not know uh, philosophy. Uh, when we were preaching the gospel, it's not that we were not aware of philosophy. Apostle Paul claimed that he himself was a learned man. He, he had the advantage of being a Jew. Um, a Pharisee and uh, a very learned one. But remember also that Apostle Paul was not brought up in, uh, in uh, Palestine. He was brought up uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the diaspora. He was brought up uh, where in, in open cities. Uh, Tassas was, was, was not in, in Palestine where Apostle Paul came from. Uh, it was more of a Greek city. Uh, uh, it was more of what we would call Hellenistic city. There were Jews who were living in the Greek world. And so Apostle Paul, as much as he was learned in the Jewish uh, basic education of the law, he was brought up in an environment uh, in an open city that um, he, he was very much aware of what goes on in the the learning of the Greeks and so on. And uh, you find even a lot of his style of writing was more Greek than Jewish. His style. But his message, his message was very different, was not Greek. He bases his message on the word of God, but he has the Greek argumentative uh, principles, um, a way of arguing. Uh, the Jewish way was just giving orders as the law. You know, you don't argue, you, you don't give room for discussions. 
you just make a statement. But the Jewish, uh, the Greeks were very good in arguing a point um, and saying truth is relative. It depends on you. So you have to argue your own truth, your own facts. And you find that style so much in uh, Pauline Epistles. But particularly now here he talks about uh, he talks about the gospel and he tells them uh, there were some people who were thinking that the Greek wisdom was superior to the gospel because it seems like the gospel was from the Jews. But Apostle Paul is telling them the gospel is not even from the Jews. In fact, the gospel is an offense to the Jews. Uh, the Jews, they hate the gospel. And so it is not Jewish. The gospel is from heaven. And it came with Christ. The gospel is not the Jewish philosophy. The gospel is not Greek philosophy. The gospel is God's philosophy. It is philosophy from heaven. It is wisdom from heaven. It is God's wisdom. This gospel. And so he says that the Jews are looking for um, wisdom. Well, the Greeks are looking for wisdom. The Jews are looking for signs. They want a sign. And you remember them even trying to tell Jesus, what sign can you give us? Moses gave us bread. What sign can you give us? They wanted to see a sign to tell someone that you are anointed and called of God in order to present anything. But now he is saying... Um, this one is different. It's very different. It's far above the Jewish uh, philosophy. It's far above the Greek philosophy. This is God's philosophy. Uh, it is God's wisdom. It is God's uh, answer to, uh, to man's needs. It is man, uh, God's answer to man's questions. The, the, the cross, the gospel of the cross, it is the remedy to uh, the human problem. It is the remedy to the world problem. It is, it is the healing charm from God to uh, man's sickness, which is sin, you know, um, uh, which is sin. And so he's saying it, it, is, it is not inferior in any way. So you don't start to think that simply because someone came arguing things very well, now, okay, the, the gospel is for the poor people, the gospel is for the weak people, the gospel is for illiterate people. He says the gospel is wisdom above all wisdom. It is wisdom above the Jewish wisdom. It is wisdom above the Greek wisdom. And he says uh, the Jews thinking they were very, very wise, they crucified the Lord of glory. The very Savior they are own creator, they are own God. They crucified him. So their wisdom became foolishness. Then he says, the Greek, in their wisdom, they are missing Christ. They are missing God's way to a life of satisfaction and peace. And he is telling the people in the church, you are given the cream you are given the best. You are given grace. That which the, the prophet and the people of old has longed for. This Christ is the rock of ages. He is the desire of ages. He is the desire of mankind. Prophesied right from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. He is the full satisfier of life. Everything else is far inferior compared to the gospel. Every kind of learning this world can ever offer. And you know what you're saying? This is the wisdom of God. And he says the foolishness of God is much wiser than human greatest intelligence. The weakness of God is far greater than the greatness, the greatest strength of mankind. 
So how would you think of this? You know, human beings have a tendency of despising everything they don't understand. They will speak negative about. It says, because they don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel is a mystery. How can someone crucified on a cross become the source of eternal salvation? How can a blood of a person become the very cause of forgiveness of all sins ever committed, past, present, and future? He says, it's a mystery. But he says, the gospel, as foolish as it may look, is the way that God chose to save mankind is the very source of human peace, is the primary uh, source of eternal life, is the primary source of lives, of a satisfied life. The gospel is the greatest provision God will ever give second to life. And when you despise the gospel, you turn to be the most foolish person that heaven has ever encountered. It doesn't matter how high you are according to human levels. If you reject the gospel, you become a useless thing as far as heaven is concerned. The gospel is the basis upon which God deals with mankind. That the person at ground zero is the person who have received Jesus Christ in their lives. Accepted the gospel of the cross. Accepted the washing of the blood of Jesus by faith. You are now standing at point zero. Now you can stand, start to climb the stairs of God's blessings. Everybody else who have rejected the gospel is far below the point zero. You are living in the negative life as far as heaven is concerned. Even if you are the best among men, then you are the best among the rejects. Because everybody who rejects the gospel becomes God's reject. The issue of heaven and eternal life start at the point of accepting the gospel. And Jesus Christ, he is primarily the gospel. And accepting Jesus Christ it is from there now God can start dealing with you. Because the Bible says, those who receive him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. At the accepting of the gospel, you are born. In other words, once you receive Jesus Christ, invite him in your life and confess him as Lord and Savior, be, you are now born again. According to God, now you have started to exist. You have started to if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, you have not even started to exist as far as God is concerned. You are not there. You are not there. As far as God is concerned, you don't exist. You are not living. Man may see you. God would only see you as a walking corpse. You have not started living. That's why I'm saying the gospel is the point zero. The ground zero from which now God starts operating in your life. The day you give your life to Jesus, that's your first day of existence as far as heaven is concerned. That's why the Bible says, it pleased God that through the preaching of the gospel, the gospel of the cross, that God will save the world. It looks foolishness 
preaching the gospel. While other people are presenting other wonderful philosophies. Worldly philosophies. And compared, the gospel compared with world philosophies, it looks cheap. It looks something too low. And some people have concluded that the gospel is for the poor, the weak, and the forsaken. Thank God. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved by this gospel, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In almost every generation, there is always a philosophy that wants to overshadow the gospel. Human beings will come with philosophies from hell and from the uh, weak-willed minds. And these philosophies would want to overshadow the gospel. And treating those who follow after the gospel as the people of before, we are the modern people. And it looks, it looks beautiful. That people start to feel like if you are born again, you belong to the lower class. But you know, every human philosophy fails. At the climax of it, it collapses. There has been numerous philosophies in this world. And at a certain point, every one of them failed. But the gospel moves on. Because the gospel is for all generations, for all people, and for all localities. Everywhere in the world, the gospel is applicable. It is applicable to the high and mighty. It's applicable to the low and poor. The gospel is for the educated as well as it is for the illiterate. The gospel is for the African as well as it is for the Caucasian. The gospel is for people of every generation. First century as well as the 20th century. It is God's healing charm for mankind. And whoever misses the gospel misses all. No matter what else you have. And even in our generation, there are various philosophies that are trying to overshadow the gospel. But the gospel has never lost its charm, has never lost its power. And even in our time, the gospel is still as powerful as it was in the first century. Because it's based, based on the eternal blood of the Son of God who is forever to be praised. And it works to this day. He who believes, he who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. As it worked in those times, it works now. Hebrews 13, 8 For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't let anybody discredit you because you have believed in the gospel. Don't let anybody throw you into the dustbin. Trying to prove that they are better than you because they have a new philosophy. Every other philosophy is fake, short lived, and weak. the cross of Christ the gospel of the cross eternally a million years from now we shall proclaim it as it was proclaimed when Jesus died on the cross and we need to embrace it and to accept it and to cherish it 
keep it close to the heart. It's God's way of salvation for mankind. And even this day, it is still works. By, by and through the gospel, we are saved. Through the gospel, we are healed. Through the gospel, our lives are sustained. And through the gospel, we shall go to heaven. It works today as it worked the first time. Praise the name of the Lord. I want us to bow our heads down now for a word of prayer in the name of Jesus. Our dear Heavenly Father, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for entrusting us with the gospel. We thank you for this great grace that is upon our lives that the learned and the mighty are looking but they are missing but you gave us we who were humble, poor, wretched in your grace you gave us the gospel you gave us eternal life through the gospel given us eternal healing through the gospel. You've given us eternal forgiveness through the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will strengthen us to stand strong and tall, knowing that we are a privileged people to have come across the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I pray, Abba Father, that you will stretch out this grace to many in our generation that need it. Many that are seeking for a satisfactory life in the wrong places. Many are seeking in money. Others are seeking in human education. Others are seeking in many other ways. And missing all the gospel is here all along. I pray that you revive the hearts of men. That Lord you will pour down a revival in our time. And turn back your people back to yourself. We pray for the members of our families that have not known you Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our countrymen that have not known you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for our generation, many that have never known you, Jesus Christ, and yet you are here. You are here, and the Bible says, whoever shall call upon your name shall be delivered. And I pray, Lord Almighty, that you will strengthen us to speak loud and clear that we may be hard to the very ends of the earth. That God has given us eternal life. And that life, eternal life is in his son Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe in him does not have eternal life. And we pray Lord that you strengthen the church. Strengthen your people. As we pray for those who are watching and listening and they have not known you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, you will touch their lives and hearts and draw them to yourself so that in this ministry you may harvest souls of men back to yourself. We thank you and we bless you to know that all is well and done. For it is in the wonderful name of Jesus. I pray also for those who are sick that are participating in this service. I release a word of healing in the mighty and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I speak healing now. Healing of hearts. Healing of bodies. Healing of lives. Healing of families. In the name of Jesus Christ. I release the healing power 
of the name of Jesus Christ to touch them and make them whole. I also pray for many who are going through hard times. Lord, as your word says, whoever shall call upon you shall be delivered. I pray deliverance for all those who are calling upon your name today so that through them you may have a testimony that you are a God who is close and that the gospel works. We thank you and we bless you in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And we say a good amen. Maybe you are there, you are not born again, and today you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ. Kindly repeat this prayer after me in Jesus' name. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you a sinner. Please forgive me all of my sins. Wash me with your precious blood. Today I renounce Satan and all his works. I open the door of my heart to you, Lord Jesus. I invite you into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Enable me to live for you the rest of my days. In your name, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you and give you peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and we all say a good amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. See you again tomorrow. Amen.